environmental studies, all the studies that uh, the departments that contributed, and of course the the donors. Um, it's a pleasure being here, and I was really pleased to get the opportunity to sort of expand my thinking and my work that it's mostly on food, also onto environmental politics as they connect to food. So it's the first time that I present this material here. Um, looking forward uh, to hearing your feedback because probably you're in environmental studies, you have very specific points of view on what I'm gonna say. So I will start from uh, a, a recent project. I've been working for seven years in Poland now. I mean, not all the time, but uh, going back pretty often. Uh, and so, to introduce the concept of gastronativism, I will use a, a few examples. Uh, this is a soup called uh, barst in, in Poland, but here is known as borscht. It's a, a meat-based soup. Why are we talking about this? Because in 2022, Ukraine, the country of Ukraine, right after the attack by Russia, uh, had barst added to the list, the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage, which created problems, of course, because Russia was saying, well, we have bars too. Other countries in the area have bars. Uh, Poland, Lithuania, Belarus. But at the moment, bars in a way was attributed to Ukraine to create a sense of community between the countries that were opposing Russia in some way. So it acquired a very specific uh, political meaning to separate the us, sort of the new democracies of the East and Russia that were becoming threatening again, like in the old times of the Soviet empire, or at least it, it's experienced as such in, in those countries. So at the beginning, there was a lot of solidarity towards Ukrainians. Uh, millions of Ukrainians moved to nearby, in nearby countries, including Poland. Um, food became really central at the moment because these people needed to be fed. And at the, at the beginning, especially the government was not doing much. So it was really civil society that got together, organized soup kitchens, um, and other ways to feed is, I think right now it's over 3 million um, refugees from, from Ukraine that moved to, to Poland. So this food sharing became also very symbolic to underlying the, the closeness between Poland and Ukraine. They're not just close in geographically. For many centuries, they were part of the same sort of um, country, it was called the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. The language is pretty close. They can sort of understand each other. So uh, there was a lot of goodwill. But then, of course, food came up again, but not in such a positive way. Uh, because of the presence of the Russian fleet in the, in the Black Sea, Ukraine was not able to export their, their wheat by boat, by ship. You know that there are agreements, Turkey has tried to intervene and help agreements, but the solution was to try to get wheat uh, by land. And so of course it had to cross the nearby countries from Slovakia to Hungary to Poland. The issue was that some of that wheat was not just passing by, you know, crossing those countries, was actually sold in those countries, which of course increased the supply of wheat, which depressed the prices. And so the result was that Polish farmers started demonstrating against the sale of Ukrainian wheat in Poland. So here food became the object of, of very strong contrast. The government, the, the present government, um, supported the farmers 
the government in Poland right now, it's a conservative government. Their electoral base is very much in the countryside. As a matter of fact, the next elections are gonna be on Sunday. It's really neck to neck. Let's see what, what happens. And so the government intervened and they're trying to figure out how to deal with this. There were contrasts with the EU. The EU wanted this weed to keep on flowing, also to support Ukraine. So the, the Polish government had clashes with the EU uh, regarding this, this topic. And this is last week. Actually, I wrote a post on my blog. Um, the, minister, the vice minister of agriculture wrote a tweet, well, an ex post, sorry, uh, where basically said, eat Polish macaron pasta because it's much better than Italian pasta. <laughs> it has, you know, Italians like hard uh, durum wheat pasta. It's hard. It takes a long to, time to cook. It doesn't have egg. So there were also lots of factual mistakes about the way we make and eat pasta. But it, it was really interesting that one week before the elections, this agricultural vice ministry was appealing to farmers, clearly. And so... It, it was using food, talking to the farmers, because for them it's an economic issue, but also talking to Poles, saying, see, our food is better than theirs. Even, you know, these Italians are famous for pasta, whatever. Our soft wheat pasta is so much better. Plus, you know, as civilized people, we eat pasta in soups, while Italians eat them in, um, they say, main dishes, which is also factually not correct. So I wanted to show you these few examples to, oh, last element also from Poland, um, to show how food and the environment become entangled in these political issues. Here you have two um, magazine covers that came out more or less at the same time. The one on the right, uh, well, no, your left, sorry, uh, says, Insect on, on the dish, on the plate, a uh, cooking revolution. This is a conservative magazine that was basically saying that the EU eventually will force Poles to eat crickets instead of, of meat because that's, you know, those leftist people want environmental control of meat production and all that. While Newsweek, writes the meat problem of the Poles, meaning that Poles eat way too much meat with all the environmental consequence that this has. So this, and we'll talk more about meat because in terms of food and environment and identity politics has become really, really central. But here you have an example of how it works uh, in internal politics. So basically you have the conservative, um, party attached to tradition, to the spirit of Poland, and then you have the more progressive ones that also are part of this global movement, you know, to reduce meat uh, consumption, to be more uh, aware of the impact of meat production on the environment. So this is a little bit the theme of my book that I will try, I mean, in the book, there is quite a bit of environment, but I had not organized a whole talk about it. Uh, so I came up with this name, gastronativism, because I wanted to describe a phenomenon uh, that is quite peculiar. So for me, it's the ideological use of food in politics to advance ideas about who belongs to a community in any way, at any scale, it might be defined. And we'll see, you know, here, already in the example we saw, we saw the nations, but also we saw internal politics, progressives, conservatives, and we'll see that there are many other ways in which community can be defined around food and the relation between food and the environment. It's a global phenomenon. Actually, I wrote the book because I kept on seeing the same theme popping up I don't know, in the Philippines and in India and in Brazil and in Italy, I was like, hold on, there is something going on here. Why is it food used like this? 
uh, I think it's connected to this specific form of globalizations we're living through that you may call you know, liberal globalization, but it's a very specific kind of globalization that started in the 80s. And we're still living through it, although now sort of in a crisis because of the emergence of populist movements that are sort of resisting the idea of free trade, the idea of um, eliminating barriers uh, between countries, movement of people. Those are ideas that were very strong in the 80s and in the 90s also. That's when the WTO, for instance, was launched. But this new conservative populist nationalist movements around the world are sort of criticizing it, trying to, to stop it in many ways. What happens though, is that all these little dots on the map are also connected with each other. So the Polish conservatives do speak with conservatives in the US, they do speak with conservatives in Italy, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, I was invited by the Italian language program, so there will be Italian um, examples, plus I am Italian, Roman, born and raised, uh, so it's home. Uh, I'm gonna use some of, of those examples. So let's go back to meat. So we saw, for instance, that meat has become a topic of tension between conservative and progressive. This is another form in which meat became important. Uh, in 2020, and I'll have some notes because there are tons of dates and, and names, the city of Randers in Denmark tried to introduce uh, a regulation according to which uh, fricadelle, which is pork meatballs, would become part of uh, school food because fricadellen are a symbol of Danish culture. Of course, what does this gesture mean? It was mostly a, a symbolic gesture. Who gets excluded by the fact that those pork meatballs are present in the school? Of course, the recent Muslim immigrants, but not only that, how about Danish Jews? who have been living in, in Denmark for, for centuries. How about vegetarians? How about people that embrace, you know, veganism for environmental reasons or ethical reasons? The government was basically saying, all these groups are not us. The real Danes eat pork and in this specific traditional form. So here also the environment came in because of course, what is the environmental impact of pork in Denmark? Denmark produces a crazy amount of pork considered the, the tiny country that it is. And so it's very much discussed also from that point of view. What, what happens when there is so much meat production in a small country? Plus they produce lots of milk, cheese, uh, all of that. So that became part of that conversation. This is uh, a few years earlier in 2017 in Germany. Again, pork was used in politics. Uh, these are posters by um, the party in Germany is called Alternative für Deutschland. So Alternative for, Ger for Germany. It's, um, it's a right wing, not conservative, straight up right wing uh, party that it's really growing in Germany. And in 2017, they appeared for the first time in the elections, they got a big success and they published this sort of posters. That one says, um, Islam, it doesn't fit in our cuisine. This other one says, Burka, I'm more of a burgundy kind of person. So you see that they use food that they felt was recognizable as German. Again, to say, this is us, everybody else is others. And it's not just the, the Muslim immigrants, it's also the people that want our society to become cosmopolitan. What happens to German culture? And largely, what happens to European culture? There is very much this discourse of 
sort of clash of civilization going on here. Even the Pope in my city, Rome, got involved in these conversations. In 2019, in November, uh, they organized um, a dinner for, for the poor to sort of raise money and raise uh, awareness. And they decided to serve uh, lasagna, but instead of using pork meat, they used chicken. So it would be more inclusive, more people could uh, enjoy it. Even the Pope was attacked as somebody who wants to lose the identity of Europe, uh, has accepted this sort of cosmopolitanism, um, white chicken, not pork. Of course, the Pope is even Argentinian, but you know, it was <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> but in Italy for a few days, it was a controversy, you know. In India, also a very important case uh, with the race of the BGP party, which is sort of a conservative Hindu party, there has been the explosion of these so-called um, cow protectors. I don't even try to say that in MD, but these are a group of people that basically protect the cows, but in practice, they attack people that they feel are involved with uh, cow slaughtering or buffalo slaughtering. What's the problem here? There are tons of people in India that are A, not vegetarian, even Hindus. Um, so there is already this religious undertones. So all the Muslims, all the Christians are excluded from this. Uh, but not only that, there are castes, Hindu castes, like the Dalit, that traditionally ate awful meat cow awful meat because that was the only sort of protein that they had access to. And so there has been also pushback, not only from non-Hindus, but also Hindus from other castes uh, towards this discourse. That I'm aware of the environmental issue is not particularly a pie in the conversation. Although, you know, if you ever go to India, it, it is a reality that you have cows in, in the cities. So th th there is an impact also in, in, that, in that sense. And then we come to the US. Um, so in 2021, uh, the Daily Mail in the UK picked up on something that uh, Biden had said, referring to a study from University of Michigan that just pointed the connection between uh, meat and the environment. Daily Mail started saying that, you know, this is another example of woke environmental politics. Um, of course, the Trump White House picked that up. Um, and well, not the white, the Trump White House, sorry, an economic uh, counselor of Trump. And the right-wing media also made a big deal about this. So you can see what showed up in, on Fox News, you know, up in your grill, because of course the, the theme was, see, uh, for this 4th of July, we won't be able to grill burgers, we'll have to grill Brussels sprouts. Uh, so, Biden's climate requirements. This has already become a requirement. Cut 90% of red meat from diet, maximum four uh, pounds per year, one burger per month. Why is this interesting? Oh, by the way, after a few days, even Fox News said, okay, this was fake news, sorry. Uh, they actually apologized about the whole, but now it was already in the side, guys. People were exchanging memes online and it became a big topic. And here it's very interesting that these environmental issues, again, were connected with political tensions between the part of Americans that think that maybe we can eat a little less burgers and the part of Americans that say, no, that's who we are and that's what we want to grill on the 4th of July. The mention of the 4th of July in this context is very meaningful because that's sort of the quintessential American uh, holiday 
So once again, the, the conversation here was, who's the real American? Are these people real Americans? Or are we grilling tons of burgers on the 4th of July, the real Americans? Oh, I think I lost, well, never mind. So um, one element that I found interesting in these forms of gastronativism is that they can be either exclusionary, meaning this is us and we refuse anybody else. Actually, we don't want them to join us because they are fundamentally different. And then inclusionary forms in which there is an enemy, but actually the people in the community would like more people to join because that's the only way things change. And so that's, for instance, the, the case for anti-globalization movements, um, environmental movements. Of course, it's clear who the big guys are, but there is not any attempt to say, no, you cannot be part of this movement. If you accept the tenets and the ideas, anybody can be part of it, which is quite different from, no, you cannot be part of us because you're fundamentally essentially different and we belong to different uh, communities. GMOs, of course, it's one of the most urgent global issues. Here I won't get into the science also because there are scientists in the room, so I'll just I'll zip it when it comes to that. But I want to talk about the cultural and political aspects uh, of that. So also here in this country, there is a big tension between those who say no problem with GMOs. Uh, actually, they might be good for agriculture, depending on the plants, they might be good for the environment, they can be drought resistant, they can be uh, insect resistant. And then there are those who say, no, those are Franken foods. That's not what I want to eat. And there is quite a lot of, uh, of tension about that. So this is actually a little bit all over the world. Uh, right now I'm teaching a, a course on um, food culture in China. And there is, on the one hand, the government that is trying to introduce GMOs and many consumers that don't want to hear about it. But in China, of course, the dynamics are quite different from the dynamics we can have here or we can have in, in Europe. In Europe, the situation is very peculiar in the sense that the European Union allows for the use of GMOs as long as they go through this very complicated uh, process. There is an entity uh, called the European Food Safety Agency that studies um, the, the, the seeds before approving it. Um, but any country can decide not to have those crops in their territory. And since in many countries um, there are regional autonomous, autonomous governments, here is, is the situation. So for instance, in Spain, you know, the Basque Country and Asturias and the Canary Island say, no, we don't want it at all. While the rest of Spain might be a little more iffy. Uh, but of course, it's the governments that have to make the final decisions because the EU is made of governments, not of uh, regions. I don't understand why something is wrong with the, huh. From now on, there are no more slides. Oh, you think? Let's try again if they are loading. I don't know where I am. I don't know how to do that in this because it's connected. Sorry about this. 
No problem. While we do this, if there are any questions, <laughs> or yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Olivia and Carrie Holstein. I um, am instructor at the art school. I uh, am a master's student in urban environmental policy and planning, and I run a studio here in Cambridge uh, in sustainable artistic and culinary practices called Edible Nest Studio. And I'll be giving a presentation at the Food Studies Conference called next week, right? <laughs> called creativity, uh, creativity and resilience in times of scarcity. And I was really touched by the example, example of Barche of Bar Borscht, um, as also a symbol of that scarcity. I know that uh, that became such a widespread food because those were the ingredients were some of the only ingredients people could grow themselves in those areas during times of Soviet Union starvation. Like, oh, like Cucina Povera, right? which has come out, I think it was last year or the year before, but also uh, Bread is Gold, which is more of this zero waste movement. So the comparison to uh, having, you know, being creative in the face of uh, these dire circumstances, war, uh, fascism, et cetera, or um, the political choice or like the, the identifying environmental choice. So, Probably. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, now I'm on. Um, also during fascism, though, there was this attempt, uh, for instance, in Italy, the fascist government saying, first of all, we're going to come up with new seeds, new breeds, so more people will have to eat. But also the nutritionists connected with the government were sort of introducing the idea that Mediterranean people, by nature, don't need to eat that much. You know, we're a little different, which was quite weird because people were were hungry. So very often also the perception of scarcity, it's a cultural perception in the sense it become the objects of political discussions. For instance, in Poland, you know, there is this idea of Poles traditionally eat meat. If you ask any historian, they will explain to you that maybe 3% of the population ate meat and the rest ate vegetables, borscht, and, and whatnot. So the fact that now a part of the country identified with, identifies with meat as part a central part of their food, it's also a sense of we don't want to be connected with that poverty in the past. And this is our identity, even if it's an invented identity, right? An invented tradition, Hobsbawm, for those who do uh, cultural studies or literary uh, studies. And very often because of this, the environmental impact of these choices are not really discussed, except for having, you know, the reactions like, no, we don't want to eat insects. We know that they're good for the environment, but these are, you know, those decadent Westerners that are trying to destroy our culture. All right, let me go back to this example and then the, we will have time for conversation. This uh, is an Italian example. It happened in the Northeast in, near the city of Pordenone. There was this agronomist, so actually a scientist. Uh, his name was Giorgio Finedato, that somehow went against the government. He wanted to plant this uh, GMO breed of corn that had been approved by the EU, but the Italian government said, okay, you can do it, but only if we give, we, if we give you permit after experimentation and whatnot, nothing happened. 
he just planted it. Well, the government went against him, saying, you, you've broken the law. But even, I mean, worse, there were some uh, environmentalist uh, organizations that actually went into his field and destroyed the fields. And so that, that was, you know, basically what he was left with. Uh, in all this, uh, the president of the nearby region belonging to a party called Lega, which is sort of a conservative anti-migration party, was actually siding with the government saying, no, we cannot have GMOs because that goes against you know, who we are, our identity as Italians, which was very important for them. This is the party that put out posters saying, yes to polenta, no, no to couscous. Just to give you an idea of how they use food in this sort of identity, identity politics. Uh, now, what's very interesting is that recently, in June 2023, the current government, which is also a conservative government led by a right-wing party, approved the more experimentation and more planting of GMO, uh, GMO crops as part of a larger law about uh, droughts. Droughts have been a huge problem in Italy, in Southern Europe in general, big impact on agriculture. So as part of that, the government is saying, okay, maybe we can try with drought resistant GMO crops, which of course, creates uh, protests and pushback. This is a, a, a demonstration by Lega Ambiente, which is, means the, the Environmental League, that are still protesting this, also pointing out that this was quite a sneaky uh, element. So after a few years, here you have the conservative uh, government say, okay, no, GMOs are actually okay. In, I won't get into Italian politics because A, it's very complicated and B, there is a camera there, so I'll keep it vague. Well, this is our prime minister now, Giorgio Meloni, and um, that's the, the, the government, the, the coalition that introduced the GMOs in, in this law. But I also want to point out that they changed the name of the Ministry of, of Agriculture into the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, food sovereignty. Now you have a right-wing government talking about food sovereignty, which for me was quite interesting. What does it mean for them? It means in a way, the nation is the most important entity. Nobody can tell us what, what to do, especially the EU. So this is the sense in which they use the term. But as we know, the term was not developed in that sort of political or ideological environment, right? So uh, food sovereignty came out of movement like, uh, uh, like La Via Campesina, which is a farmer's movement that is actually opposing the introduction of GMOs as an expression of certain forms of capitalism or uh, intellectual property of injustice. They want every community to be able to decide what is their food, what they want to grow, what can be imported. But it's a progressive, if not straight up leftist movement. So it's interesting how the same expression when it's connected with these food and environmental issues can have really very different meanings depending on how they are used in the, in the political uh, context. And I'll finish just with a few examples. I don't have a watch, but I do. I'm good? 1240. Oh, 1240. Okay, so I have a few more minutes. A few examples around the world of these dynamics. Um, Brazil, under the previous government, was president uh, with uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who was president until October 2022. There was a big 
push for deforestation of the Amazon to increase the production of meat, which is a very important resource for Brazil. Of course, again, you have this gastronativist politics that are activated. So on the one hand, you have the indigenous populations of the Amazon that were pushing back because they're like, you're destroying our land, our home to um, raise cattle. But also you had the opposition to Bolsonaro, of course, embrace the theme and accuse Bolsonaro of going against, you know, everything that they hold here, including uh, the environment, but also including, you know, the correct treatment of indigenous population. So once again, we see these dynamics that work both at the international level, but also internally. Here it's indigenous, non-indigenous, leftist, rightist, and all this level sort of overlap with each other. And so analyzing them require attention and, and requires looking at them in a very broad framework. You cannot just look at that. You have to see how that connects with nodes around the world. Ar Argent Ar Argentina, sorry, I get a little bit confused. Uh, they're also, they're gonna have their elections, not this Sunday, the following one. This guy, his name is Javier Milei. It's somebody who presents itself as a liberal, but in reality is very much uh, for, you know, that sort of uh, global trade and neoliberal globalization. He's pushing for the dollarization of Argentina. The consequence was that two days ago, the Argentinian pesos just tanked. So now there are lots of discussions about that. But coming to our theme, on the one hand, here you can see is the guy in the center, is there with the farmers, the cattle, uh, farmers because cattle is very important in Argentina, but also he's pushing for a law that they tried to introduce in 2019 that wants to protect more intellectual property. So they want, with this law, they want to stop the possibility for farmers to reuse seeds in following crops. Every time you use the seed, you have to pay to the owners of the intellectual property. So already in 2019, there were huge demonstrations against that. And now this politician who, for instance, in the primaries in September was number one. So he might become the leader of Argentina. What is the impact on that on Argentinian agriculture with this latest semilla, uh, the seed law, and what the environmental impact will be but again, also this discussion is caught into this right, left, peronismo, conservatism um, in Argentina. Also in Argentina, again, pork became an important issue because uh, the Argentinian government want to sign an agreement with China to increase the uh, amount of pork raised in Argentina to be sold in China. As you know, China doesn't have enough land to, to grow all the pork that the population wants now. Chinese population is going through what we call the nutrition transition. So it's increasing its consumption of meat, dairy, eggs. They have to come from somewhere. Of course, Argentina has a tradition of uh, raising animals for, for slaughters, but there were lots of demonstrations because these agreements apparently did not uh, control the environmental impact. And as we know, uh, pig farms can be very detrimental to the environment. So what was the solution? Suddenly it was not the government making agreements, but it were regional leaders and private Chinese companies. So the pig farms are there, still with a lot of, of pushback. This is becoming an issue also in the US. Uh, as you know, Smithfield has been bought by Chinese entities. 
so many of the pigs raised here are being brought to China, but the environmental impact is here. And as we know, there are lots of issues of environmental justice. In which communities are these pig farms? Is everybody impacted the same way? And we know that's not the case. Very often, this happens in poor communities, communities of color, uh, above all in the South. So you see how this becomes a global issue. You cannot look at any piece. You have to look at the connection between all these elements. What's the consequence of this complication? You have people in Taiwan protesting the increase of import of pork from uh, the US. Not only because the, the way it's raised, it's, they feel it's not safe, but also they know that in reality, that pork is Chinese pork, even if it's raised in, 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 in China. So there you have the environmental aspect and the political aspect, the tension between Taiwan and mainland China that get expressed, as you can see, in this huge floating pork uh, in the demonstration. Uh, Fukushima. You remember in 2011, uh, there was the, this meltdown of nuclear plants. Uh, so for many years, fishing was not possible, but above all, uh, the waters that were uh, in the plant were not poured back into the sea. At the end of August of this year, the Japanese government decided that now those waters were safe enough you can put them back into, into the sea. Of course, uh, the Japanese government says it's safe. We can go back fishing in the area. Not everybody agreed. China stopped the, the import of uh, Japanese fish. Of course, there, is, there are environmental co concerns, but there are also these underlying tension between Japan and China. In Japan itself, here the tension was between the government and environmentalist groups that say, you know, don't pour the polluted water back into the sea. Korea, the, the image is quite self-explanatory. Again, you have the environmental issues, but also the political issues between Korea and, and Japan. In all this, there are Chinese fishermen that apparently have no problem fishing in those waters and then selling the fish as Chinese. So there is also this element. There you go into sort of a class thing where people who have the choice of picking what they eat can have a say on where their fish comes from. Other people cannot. This is an aside, but I found it interesting. Starting in 2020, the Chinese government started cracking down on mukbang. I don't know if you're familiar with the phenomenon. Basically, there are people gorging online and they have thousands of followers. Many are from Korea. Mukbang is a, is a Korean word. The Chinese government started cracking down on them using environmental concerns and food waste concerns. While there is also the aspect of that's a corrupt, something that can corrupt our youth. So we don't want it, but they couldn't really say that. And so the environmental issues became a good um, way to explain it. Last example, whaling. So we have many clashes. Um, in 2013, we have this Australian uh, boat belonging to Sea Shepherd, it's an environmental organization that clashed, clashed with a Japanese uh, whaling boat. Australia accused Japan of attacking the boat and, and vice versa. But this was sort of one of the first salve of a greater battle, global battle. Again, this is one case in which two countries are involved, but it's actually a global environmental issue. Whales, you know, are traveling and not just in the water of one country. So at the same time, you have the development of Save the Whales as a movement, uh, very strong 
but you also have a pushback. So from 85, 86, we have a moratorium on, on whale fishing that not all countries, except for instance, Japan, keeps on doing it. There is a loophole in the moratorium that say, if you do it for research, it's fine. But actually Japanese company are selling the meat and the, it's called the blubber uh, for uh, pharmaceutical uh, products and health products. Norway hasn't stopped whaling. Iceland did in 2019. Uh, but I want to show, this is the last image because there are many indigenous populations that are saying, well, we understand the, the, the environmental issues, but this is part of our tradition and this is part of our nutrition. So there are native tribes in the US, in Russia, in Canada, that are saying, okay, what shall we do here? So you have the environmental movements that are trying to save the whales, but at the same time are at odds with the indigenous movements. And supposedly they are on the same side, on the same side, sorry. So you see how all these issues become uh, intermingled. So you have the level of the nation that very often is the most visible, but then you have international phenomenon, globalization, international agreements, international institutions, and then you have tensions within nations, between regions, between groups that distinguish themselves based on their ethnicity, on their religion, on their politics. That's why I developed this concept of gastronegativism that tries to take this complexity into the account. So it's not just nationalism. Nationalism is one of the horizons. But to fully understand what goes on, we need to be able to switch between levels, scales, and also ways in which we define community. And I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do have some time for questions, if um, and I'll bring the mic to you. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, so I I come from like a state in India. Uh, at the south, which is like different from, I mean, this is more related to the BJP topic you brought up. You're from Kerala? Yeah, I'm from yeah. Kerala. So um, in Kerala, there is like a, a lot of people eat beef and it's mm -hmm. like very, Kerala is also relatively compared to other states, like a little more like multi-religious and um, so so the kind of like the beef consumption kind of goes like across, you know, religious yeah. backgrounds and like even, so a lot of Hindus eat beef, you know, yeah, but, yeah. because it's part of their like, Kerala identity to eat beef so um in recent years like so this this kind of like opposes the whole like BJP's you know push against beef but also in recent years um there's been like a huge like growth in like you know the Muslim and Christian population in Kerala and so recently like Hinduism in Kerala is like a more like contentious topic because it's like you know the Hindus feel a, a lot more like I am a Hindu not that I agree with this particular view but it's like um the number it, it's a very different like big cultural like shift that's taken place so the hindus now feel yeah. you know a bigger desire to assert their hinduism in some way mm -hmm. and so the bjp is trying to like get a stronger like foothold in kerala because now there's like an opportunity yeah. here um so in this situation like it's just really interesting to think about beef because beef is not i mean the bjp so far has is only been like very slightly and more gradually successful in like gaining that foothold. Mm -hmm. But beef rarely comes up as a topic because they know that like Kerala is a little trickier. But it's also, I mean, so I'm just wondering, like, given this kind of situation, like how does it it's the food in question is is in, in two different kinds of conflict here, like one in the religious aspect and the other in this kind of political. Yeah, political, but also just so so how do we like mm. see beef in the situation and does it transfer to like other identities so yeah. that we can avoid talking about these two? Well, 
avoiding the situation is going to be complicated. Just for the people that are not familiar with Southern Indian politics, Kerala is a state that to this day is a leftist state run by officially the Communist Party, which for the rest of India is like really unusual. So there is also this element that this state has a very strong sense of its own um, political independence and the way <clears throat> this political independence translated into this more multicultural society in which, as you were saying, you know, there were Hindus and Christians and Muslims. I recently was invited to Kerala by the uh, Kerala Ministry of uh, Education to talk about food studies in Muslim colleges. Uh, the community is called Mapala there. Uh, because they wanted to use food and food culture as a way to uh, raise the profile of women. So here you have you know, Muslim colleges that are thinking about what is the role of women, which also explains what kind of Muslim communities are in Kerala, uh, which is quite interesting. So you have these political issues, these cultural issues, religious issues, and the race of the national, at the national level of this conservative Hindu party that gets inspiration for a specific interpretation of Hinduism that became sort of, was developed in the 1920s. So a hundred years later, they're, they're getting there. But there is also this sense of in Kerala, okay, the Christians and Muslim populations are growing. What happens to us Hindus? And the national politics are impacting because they are trying to leverage this sense of like, okay, the balance among communities is changing. Will we be threatened here in Kerala as we have never been before? So I think what will happen will be very much also connected with the politics of Kerala, which kind of government will be there if, if the national uh, BJP party will manage to get enough Hindus, sort of relinquish the centrality of Kerala identity and embrace the centrality of Hindu. Um, we'll see, I mean, that's, that's a big question. Thank you. We have time for another question here um, online. Can you please speak about gastro-nativism in the context of urban policy, mm. such as the actions of members of cities of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact? Yeah. So also within urban environments, of course, food production is quite central. And so there, there has been a lot of attempts at bringing more food production within cities. It can be anything. It can be urban agriculture. It can be raising bees. It can be producing food in, in cities in a way that is sustainable, but also very much embraces the principles of circular economy. I mean, I only had 40 minutes, so I couldn't go too much into details, but that becomes a very important element. The elements of circular economy immediately puts that kind of politics in a progressive framework because it's not about producing more. It's not about consuming more. It's about a more balanced consumption. Not only that, very much in the Milan Declaration, there is the idea, does everybody have access to the same quality of food in cities? What are the dynamics that makes that some people eat better than others? So in this sense, you know, you have the politics of environmental movements of, as opposed to maybe more conservative movements, but also movements that think about econo economic production in a neoliberal way. On top of that, you have class differences, you have cultural differences. So once again, you know, to understand fully all these elements, we have to think about them in their complexity. Also, you know, cities that sign that agreement are not only in Italy, are all over the world. So how does that work 
in different contexts, regional context, city context, national context. Thank you very much. We are at time. So I want to just thank Dr. Parasakoli again, thank if you, you could um, 